Well, good evening, happy Sabbath. And I welcome everyone to this study here, our continued study on uh, reading through A.T. Jones General Conference sermons from 1893. And um, before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for the time that we have every time we come together to study. But we are especially grateful for the time we have on the Sabbath and for the blessings that we have received. We pray, Lord, that you can be with us as we read and study and apply to our lives the truths found in your word, especially in regard to righteousness by faith. We know, Lord, our whole experience of righteousness by faith is tied up in the prophecies. And we just ask that as we um, look at these things, as we read from A.T. Jones, that your Holy Spirit can guide and direct our minds to understand these things. Be with each person. May you come close to them and bless them. And forgive us, Lord, for our sins and the way we we speak and treat one another, sometimes callously, sometimes not recognizing um, the impact our words can have, being careless. Help us, Lord, to be conscientious and to hear your voice speaking to us. Also, Lord, we ask that we can be receptive when somebody is speaking truths that we do not want to hear. Help us to have an open heart and mind. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Um, so before we get to reading Jones, um, I want to bring up something that came up in our afternoon study here with uh, some of the residents in this building. And we were looking at, um, we're still on day four of creation. And so we started looking at um, some of the symbols dealing with the sun and the moon and the word of God. And um, we looked at Second um, Peter chapter 1, where it talks about we have a more sure word of prophecy. And the context of that, I'll just uh, flip the screen here to go to that scripture. Um, let's... Second Peter chapter 1. And... So we know here, this is going to be um, Peter talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we know that the scriptures, the prophecies of scriptures, are inspired by the Holy Spirit, and so that the understanding of them cannot be a private interpretation, that is, through our own intellect. But we need to be inspired by the same Holy Spirit that gave God's word. And we know that the prophecy is more sure than actual eyewitness um, accounts, something that's subjective. We, I mean, Peter saw Christ transfigured. And we know that he saw Moses and Elijah. And what are Moses and Elijah symbols of? Those that are translated by see, uh, after seeing death and those that are translated without seeing death. Okay, so that's how we always think of it, and that's not incorrect. It is true. 
But what else are they symbolic of? So Rand says, the law and the prophets. And so when we look at the law and the prophets, and we have a more sure word of prophecy than seeing, you know, the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, it seems to me that Peter is, is showing that whether we understand the Old, Old Testament, what, if we're studying the Old Testament, they reveal Christ, right? Because you have the law and the prophets and Christ. So Jesus revealed to people what the law and the prophets said regarding him. And so the law and the prophets are testifying of Christ. It's also, of course, a scene of the second coming, right? They were eyewitnesses of his majesty, Christ coming into his kingdom with those Moses representing the resurrected righteous and Elijah representing the living saints at the second coming. But I mention this here because in the context of what we've been studying, we've continued to see that prophecy and the message of righteousness by faith go hand in hand. That you really can't have a knowledge of Christ without prophecy. And um, so to me, this is something that's become clearer and clearer as, as we've, we've been doing all of our studies. Um, showing how our, our lines that we are a part of, how important they are in placing our feet correctly upon the path. If we are to follow Christ, if we are to be Christ-like, we need to be watching and waiting. We need to understand prophecy. Now, um, you know, one of the things that I'm going to be doing in my Sunday afternoon studies is going to be a simple presentation of the lines. But it's it's really to clearly show um, how these two are tied together. And I'm going to incorporate um, Joanne's study that she did a couple of Sabbaths ago, um, because I think it is really pertinent. There's some things that, that we in this movement really have had a hard time understanding. And it, it's sort of a relearning that's that's going on. So, so anyway, that's just a, a, a little bit of a aside, but of course it is definitely pertinent to uh, this reading here by Jones. Now we're just going to read over a paragraph that we had ended with. So Jones has gone through this whole um, this this way of explaining the third angel's message of righteousness by faith by first going through um, the powers of the world, what the world is doing and how we are um, at the time in his view that the mighty angel of revelation 18 has come down and we would agree with him, but he's in a different line. He's in a different way mark <clears throat> here in 1893. I mean, it, like he's zoomed in on a different way mark than we are. So we're zoomed into the Sunday law. He's zoomed into Adventist history. And so what's, what's happening, happening there is he's typifying what's happening to us today. <clears throat> so he shows about how the powers of the world, that there's no way that we can win against them without Christ. That Christ is victorious. And, of course, this battle with the world is not so much with the forces of the government, of the lawmakers, of the state. It's really the battle that goes on in the human heart. So when he says here, quoting from the Bible, now the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Is the mind of Christ subject to the law of God? The congregation says yes. Was it ever anything else? The congregation says no. The mind of Christ was subject to the word of God always. The whole Bible, of course, is simply the drawing out of the law of God as it is in Christ. Well then, was not the mind of Christ always subject to the law, to the whole word of God just as it is? The congregation says yes. 
There was never any hitch upon that. Wherever the word of God was read, how did the mind of Christ receive it? It instantly received it. He would not say, now, how can that be? I wonder, don't you suppose? He said, well, now I think that means this way. Didn't he say, are you, are not you a little too strong about reading that text? Can you modify it just a little? Did he ever get troubled over what the Bible said about anything or what the Lord would say? No. Whenever the word of God was spoken, the mind of Christ instantly responded. Now, we can see here, of course, this is con in contrast to the carnal mind. Now, I want to bring you, unfortunately, back to Parminder. So back in 2017, I was at the School of the Prophets for about three weeks. Um, it, this was during the, I guess the meetings were, if I remember correctly, in Romania. These were organizational meetings, these secret meetings that were recorded. Um, and nobody was allowed to hear any of these meetings that went on. Anybody there was not supposed to speak to anybody else about what went on at that meeting. Um, so while they were there, I was at the School of the Prophets uh, doing some presentations on uh, biblical chronology. And then Parminder came near the end of this time and began to present a series having to do with the nature of man. And in this series of the nature of man, he was weaving a subtle um, thread of error. And what he was really trying to do was undermine the nature of Christ. And, and he didn't want me to answer or respond to his questions that he was asking the class. Um, now, I, I wasn't there the whole time, so I didn't. I, I ended up having to watch some of these later. Um, so I don't know how many people watched those presentations from 2017. But what, what the result was is that people who had participated in this, who I had discussions with later in 2018, people who ended up following Parminder, uh, they had this idea that they were perfect, that they weren't sinners anymore. So what do you suppose Parminder's teaching was doing? Why would somebody who's a sinner uh, not consider themselves sinning anymore? What, what, ha what did they have to believe? I know that's a bad question, but if you've ever run into somebody who believes that they're not sinning, what do they believe that has happened to them so that they don't sin? That they have become perfect. Okay, but how? Are you referring to their to their nature, their human nature? So something had to change in their nature. So throughout Adventist history, there are has been the Holy Flesh movement in Ellen White's day, right? And that was, and, and that's the one where she talks about the drums and and the emotional aspect because people were worked up into an idea that they were now sinless. Um, we had uh, Robert Brimsmead um, who taught that our nature would be changed um, at the close of probation, not at the second coming of Christ. So then we would be sinless. I've seen it um, in different ways that people use different terminology, but they're teaching the same thing. Now, the funny thing is Parminder was teaching this error and people who were on his side, that is people who actually thought like him, thought that he was on a different side of things. They thought he was teaching uh, um, that that Jesus had a sinful nature. But he was teaching Jesus had a sinless nature because he wasn't actually talking about the nature of Christ at all. He was talking about the nature of man, but he was doing it in a way that one of the things he said was, um, that 
to become a Christian just means to be nice, and anybody could be nice. Is that what it means to become a Christian? He was lowering the standard of righteousness by very subtly by changing how we see both the nature of man and thus the nature of Christ. Okay, so um, I'll get to Angela's question here um, after a bit because she put a question in the chat. But we know that, that the nature of man has a physical aspect and a spiritual aspect. Can man who is, has a sinful nature have the mind of Christ? How can a person with a sinful nature have the mind of Christ? No, it doesn't happen. Well, it, would, it does happen because Christ had a sinful nature, but he had the mind of Christ, right? So he didn't have the mind of the flesh, even though he had a fallen nature. So we can't naturally have the mind of Christ. Self has to die. So when we get a change of nature in the way that Ellen White understands it, we don't get rid of our sinful nature. Do we? We receive the mind of Christ. Right. But we have to be in Christ. That is, we don't receive it of ourselves. We don't get rid of our fleshly mind. It doesn't, I mean, we talk about it dying. It has to die, but it has to die every day. Right? Paul says, I die daily. So if we're in the flesh, if we have the mind of the flesh, if the mind of the flesh is controlling us, we're not controlled by, by the Spirit of Christ. There isn't a halfway experience. We either are submitted to Christ or we are not. When we're submitted to Christ, we are given the mind of Christ, not in the complete way that we can't get rid of it. We're given it for that moment. And we have to maintain that relationship with Christ because righteousness is in Christ. It's not in us. So when somebody says they're not sinning, I mean, they have a completely distorted view of the gospel. All that they have done is they've imagined that they're not sinning because they've changed what the definition of sin is. Right. They're not doing certain things. And, and they've changed the definition of sin to um, to appeal to the aspect of their nature. Right. So if you only do what you want. If you decide that what you don't want is sin and what you want isn't sin. Then you will never be sinning. If you do as you wilt, if you if you think that your mind is is correct, you can be doing all kinds of evil and believe that you're sinless. Right. So for somebody to believe that they're not sinning. They have to have distorted the truth of the gospel. They have to distort what sin is. That is, they don't have the mind of Christ at all, because if you have the mind of Christ, how will you see yourself? A sinner, wouldn't you? Would yeah, we see you? ourselves. We see ourselves as sinners. If we have the mind of Christ, we don't see ourselves as righteous. I mean, that's such a simple idea. The closer we come to Christ, the more sinful we appear in our own eyes. And we know that Christ did not see himself as sinless. He only knew 
that he was the son of God by faith. He trusted in his father's word. If he had gone by sight, he would have sinned, but he didn't. The works that you see me do, they come from the father. He didn't attribute any righteousness to himself, even though he was the sinless son of God. His righteousness came by faith. So Angela asks a question. Okay, so she says, I find this paragraph in A.T. Jones troubling. Didn't Christ, like all of us, have to choose to bring his mind under subjection to the word just as we do? And that is true. So, but Christ never sinned. So it's not like he was a sinner and now overcame. He was fully man as he as he was, is God, and had to die daily uh, to his carnality as we do. And that's true as well. So Christ had human nature, and he had to cling to his father for righteousness. He wouldn't have had to spend so much time and effort had he not the flesh to battle against subdue. So he definitely had a battle. And he had not been attacked by devils more than, and had he not been attacked by devils more than anybody else. So, but what Jones is talking about here is the mind of Christ. Christ always made the correct choice because if he didn't, if he didn't accept the word of God in one, at one time, that would have been sin. The whole plan of salvation would have unraveled. Now Christ struggled with the cross, you know, three times he said, let this cup pass from me. But in that whole time, he was submitted to his father's will. He felt the weight of the sins of the whole world upon him in the Garden of Gethsemane. If an angel had not come to sustain his life, he would have died there. It's something we can't even comprehend how the Son of God could be separated from the Father and feel that separation. And upon the cross, he felt that separation so much that he could not see himself coming forth from the tomb. And yet, he still trusted in his Father's will. He still chose the cross. He did not come down from it. So when we see uh, what the mind of Christ is, that that is, is perfect, it's the mind of Christ that we need. We can't trust in our own understanding. When we're studying the Bible, we need to trust in God. We can't cavile with the scriptures. We can't twist and manipulate. We can't we can't safely question what's in God's word. That doesn't mean we don't struggle sometimes to try to understand things. But when God's Holy Spirit convicts us that something is true, we have to accept it. So, for instance, uh, one of the guys at the study today, Ted, he, um, he was really struggling with the idea that Moses was resurrected. And but yet he could see it. So he knew the struggle was there. He said, you know, my mind can't accept it. You know, one part of him couldn't. But, and he still has to think about it. He still has to study it. But he could see that's what's in the scriptures. It just went so far from where he had ever thought, um, anything that he'd ever thought, uh, that it was hard for him to accept. Now, of course, as a human being, when we struggle in this way, God is trying to reach us, but Christ didn't have this same struggle. I mean, he had human nature, but he had the mind of Christ. He, had the, he did not ever let the mind of the flesh control him. And, and Parminder subtly in, in dealing with human nature tried to destroy this whole idea of what the mind of Christ is so that we could actually just have the mind of the flesh, so to speak be converted and of course that would be sinless flesh right holy flesh 
So it was it was very subtle how he was going about it. And um, <clears throat> so he says, Joan says, brethren, I know that you can know and that any man in this world can know and can have just that kind of a mind. I know that you can have just such a mind that whenever the word of God speaks, the response is instantaneous and there's no question or doubt or sign of rejection. Now you can see upon this very thing that if you and I have such a mind as that, then when the word of God is read, there's no rising up or objection or dissent. Is that the mind of Christ? The congregation says, yes. Then it is easy enough to know whether we have the mind of Christ or not. If your mind or my mind, if your disposition or my disposition or yourself or myself is not in that surrendered condition, that position of surrender unto God, that whenever he speaks in the, in the word there or by his prophets and there's anything in that mind or in that heart that raises up any objection or dissent, then whose mind have we? Congregation, the carnal mind. That is the mind that started out to object in the first place. The time has come to get rid of that thing. Now, here Jones, of course, he's talking about the receptiveness to uh, the teachings of God's word. This would also have to do with the Holy Spirit speaking to us. And Jones sometimes overstates things a little bit. Doesn't mean that he's he's incorrect, but he's 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 not presenting this in the most balanced way because we know that we can't really see whether we have the mind of Christ or not by looking at ourselves, right? Because we might imagine that we're responding to the word of God into truth. But that could be the carnal mind deceiving us. That's why we have a more sure word of prophecy. We have something objective outside of ourselves. So people can fool themselves that they're listening to God when they're just actually listening to their own mind. But, but Jones isn't addressing that point. He's addressing here the point that is if you had the mind of Christ, you would accept the word of God. You wouldn't be questioning or caviling. But I say that a man can, I say that a man can have just that kind of mind, where, whenever, and where, whatever the word of God speaks. Um, but I say that a man can have just that kind of a mind, whenever, and whatever the word of God speaks. There is an is instant response. There's nothing in that mind, or about it in the world that can rise up in objection against it. That mind is not natural to man, but a man can have it and can know that he has it and that it is the mind that we are to have. That is the mind to which the Lord can reveal his righteousness according to righteousness, because it is the mind that receives from God just what God has to give in God's own way and not in any way that I would fix up or modify or discount it. So the question here is about whether a man can know that he has that kind of a mind. Now here in this, he's, he's using this sort of in this absolute sense. But we know if we're opposed, what we could probably say, we can know when we don't have the mind of Christ by how we react to truth. We can see when our, our natural mind is resistant to hearing the word of God. When we're in darkness and light comes and we don't want to receive it. But when we receive the word of God, so when a man who's in darkness first receives the word of God, first receives light shining into his darkness, and he responds to that darkness, does he have, in a certain sense, the mind of Christ? Because could he respond to that, that light with the natural mind? The way that's asked, I would have to say, I don't think so. Yeah, so, so we know that even our repentance, everything that, that happens to us that saves us from sin, it's not based upon something in us that saves us, right? There aren't some people saved because they're better than other people. Everyone who is saved is in darkness, in sin, 
has no knowledge of God. I mean, everybody has a certain type of knowledge of God because God created everything and he put us in us a seed of faith. But we still are in darkness. And that seed of faith comes from God, doesn't come from us. And when we respond to God, this is God working in us. It's not us getting the credit for responding to God. This power, this ability to choose comes from God, but God will not choose for us. Because if he choose for us, we would merely be robots. So God has given us the freedom of choice. He's given us these opportunities. But all along the way, God is there in those choices, enabling us to make that choice, to, to take that step of faith, to reach beyond ourselves, to go from this darkness into this light. So Jones says, so then the man who receives the idea, the truth of justification by faith or righteousness by faith, according to his own idea or his own view of it, simply cannot do it. He simply has not got it. That is all. It is just the same satanic idea of righteousness by faith. It is simply the same Roman Catholic system of justification by works, passing it off for justification by faith. And the time has come now, in a great deal more serious sense than nine-tenths of us dream of, when we need to know that we have the righteousness of God and justification by faith in another sense than the Roman Catholics use it. That is settled. So what Jones is saying, in order to understand righteousness by faith, we need to, in order to have righteousness by faith, there, we need to understand what faith is. Now, we don't always have that. When we first come to God, we know that we have to believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So somehow God reveals himself to us and we desire what God is offering over what we have. But that's not because of something good in us. That's about something good in God. And that choice that we're given when we exercise it is an exercise of faith. And faith is not, is not merit. Faith does not merit us anything because it is a gift of God. <clears throat> so Jones goes on, I will read a passage or two that will connect with what, with what we had the other night. In Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 186, I read the message about the Laodicean message. I read a passage about the Laodicean message, what it is designed to do. It is designed to arouse the people of God to discover to them their backslidings and to lead to zealous repentance, that they may be favored with the presence of Jesus and be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel. Now, when we think about this, um, it seems like a pretty simple concept. I mean, we need to know our backslidings. And we need to be led to a zealous repentance. But this Laodicean message, it's designed to arouse the people of God. How does it do that? I mean, we read it. You know, it says you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And then it says we need to buy of him gold, tried in the fire, and white raiment, and eye salve. But what is the Laodicean message? I mean, we can read about it in the Bible, but how is it worked out practically? Is it just somebody telling you this or reading it in the Bible that you, this is your condition? How is it? Good? What's that, Chris? I was going to say that's part of it, but the reality is realizing that we're learning what's really in us, not just hearing someone of no particular value 
make some remark about us. It's, it's something we have to take seriously if we believe in God. Yeah, so, so there's a work that God is doing, and it, and it comes from his word, right? The Laodicean message. But it's worked out practically through our experience. As we choose to follow God, it's a three-step testing prophetic message, is it not? I mean, the question is, is the Laodicean message a three-step testing prophetic message? Let's take a look at it. Is this not the model that God has given us in regard to the lines? Okay, so when we look at, at, at the Laodicean church, what's its condition? They're not as good as they think they are. Okay. So they're rich and increased with goods. That's what they say. And have need of nothing. But knowest not, not that thou art wretched and miserable, poor and blind and naked. So we have five characteristics here. What does that tell us? Foolish virgins. Okay, this is the foolish virgins, right? Now we, now when we look at the steps here, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. We see three steps, do we not? Exactly. And we can see the gold tried in the fire it are referred to trials, right? Because trials will come. So the Christian life is not just an intellectual exercise. It's, it's about an experience. But in this situation where we have gold, where, where it's saying gold tried in the fire, mm -hmm. can we truly buy an experience? Well, yeah, we, we can't truly, but here we're going to buy this because Christ is offering it to us. But can't the gold tried in the fire also be the gold tried in the fire? Yeah, you're talking about Ellen White's writings, which we read. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we're, we're not discounting any of this referring to Ellen White. We're quite clear that this is the Laodicean message comes from the spirit of prophecy. But people need to experience it in order for it to be real. And, and to buy from Christ is to give up all that you have to seek these things. Because if you think you're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, you wouldn't go and try to buy anything of anyone, right? But he wants you to buy of something else. He wants you to take up his yoke. He wants you to take up your cross. And so this is the experience that we have as Christians. When we first make that step, uh, we enter into an experience that is trying. That's what the Christian life is. Now, this white raiment is something that we need to clothe us. This is, of course, often called, um, you know, the garment of Christ's righteousness. We need justification. Because we can't approach this Christian life if the shame of our nakedness is not covered, right? We have to take off the filthy garments, but then we're naked. And so now we need Christ's righteousness. And the anointing of thine eyes with eye salve is, of course, so that we can see, but particularly see our own course of action to see our sins. Now, we spent the last year studying um, the lines, right? Understanding the lines. And what we have found is that God has revealed to us in our personal experience as we've been studying that we're not who we thought we were. 
that our our spirit our Christian experience is not what we imagined it to be. That we're not the ones who are right. Because as Seventh Day Adventists, we need to believe what Christ says about us. And does that ever change? Is it isn't it always true? Of you know, this lay to see a message. We can't take this and say, well, you know, that used to be true about me, but I no longer think that I'm rich and increased in goods. It's only talking about other people now. Yeah, Angela says to see more and more of Christ, but isn't seeing more and more of Christ the same as seeing more and more of our of ourselves? Isn't that the mirror that we look into? The closer we come to Christ, the more sinful we appear in our own eyes. Because we can always justify ourselves if we wanted to. In fact, we seem to always want to. But God is calling us to something different. And that's to believe what Jesus says about us. And he does this because he loves us. And, and the part where it says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. That's one of the greatest invitations in scripture. And Christ says that to us. And if we're not Laodiceans, if we don't think we're Laodiceans, can we take this verse and this invitation and accept it? How could we accept it if we're not laid to sin? Exactly. So if we don't know our condition, we're not going to uh, take this invitation. Now, Ellen White, and I've said this many times, she says that we need to remove the rubbish from the door so that can, Christ can have entrance and that he can come in. I'm just kind of paraphrasing that he can clean up, right? So... Some people might take that and what Jones has been saying about, you know, what uh, the Catholics say, you have to sort of prepare yourself in order to receive justification and so forth. But what she's talking about is basically the choice to let Christ in, because we have put all these barriers in front of that door where Christ is knocking all of our self justifications. All of our criticisms of others. All of those things stand in the way of that door. And if Christ is going to come in, those things have to be removed. There is the exercise of the will, but that exercise of the will is not willpower. It's a gift from God. It's just that God will not make that choice for us. He has given us a choice to choose life. Why would you choose death? but many people will. So to choose life is something that, that we could not do if it were not for the gospel. Adam and Eve could not choose life, except that the gospel was preached to them. And then they could choose. So, you know, we understand the limitations of language, that sometimes we can read jo Jones and because of the way he sta states things, sort of read into it. And that's, of course, what his enemies did, is they, they caught him in his words if he overstated something a little bit. They would twist his words and point him out as teaching error. But Ellen White doesn't speak about Jones as teaching error. The only negative thing that I can see that Jones uh, characteristic that he had is that he could sometimes present things in a way that was unattractive. And, and part of it was his way that he tried to shake people up, so to speak. And um, so state things in a way that sort of caught them off guard. And, and I think that was a mistake of his. So sometimes when I read him, I can see how he can overstate a thing to try to arouse you 
Uh, but for some people, it created a resistance. They took it the wrong way. And, and, and she, so she wasn't saying that he was teaching error, but that he needed to make things more attractive. Um, and, and these would be aspects of his character that he needed to address. And we all have those. <clears throat> I definitely do. So, um, so he, go, he goes on, I'm going to read this again. So when the man receives the idea of truth, of justification by faith or righteousness by faith, according to his own idea or his own view of it, simply cannot do it. He simply has not got it. That is all. It is just the same satanic idea of righteousness by faith. It is simply the same Roman Catholic system of justification by works, passing it off for justification by faith. And the time has come now, in a great deal more serious sense than nine-tenths of us dream of, when we need to know that we have the righteousness of God and justification by faith in another sense than the Roman Catholics use it. That is settled. I will read a passage or two that will connect with what we had the other night, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 186. So this is this is the part we need to read, the Laodicean see message. Um, it is designed to arouse the people of God to discover them their backslidings and to lead to zealous repentance that they may be favored with the presence of Jesus and be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel. Who will be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel? Those who have the presence of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Those to whom the Laodicean message has brought by its working and its intent, the presence of Jesus Christ. This means the personal presence too, not imaginary, a way off presence. It is not that at all. Let us read the explanation of it here in Steps to Christ, page 82 and 85. When Christ ascended to heaven, the sense of his presence was still with his followers. It was a personal presence, full of love and light. Jesus the Savior who had walked and talked and prayed with them, who had spoken hope and comfort to their hearts, had, while the message of peace was still upon his lips, been taken up from them into heaven, and the tones of his voice had come back to them. As the clouds of the angels received him, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He had ascended to heaven in the form of humanity, they knew that he was before the throne of God, their friend and savior still, that his sympathies were unchanged, that he was still identified with suffering humanity. He was presenting before God the merits of his own precious blood, showing his wounded hands and feet in remembrance of the price he had paid for his redeemed. They knew that he had ascended to heaven to prepare places for them and that he would come again and take them to himself. As they met together after the ascension, they were eager to present their requests to the Father in the name of Jesus. That was a fine prayer meeting, wasn't it? There were 120 people, each one eager to present his requests to the Father in the name of Jesus. And the light goes on, so that was Joan's interjection. In solemn awe, they bowed in prayer, repeating the assurance Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. They extended their hands of faith higher and higher with the mighty argument. It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. And Pentecost brought them the presence of the Comforter, of whom Christ had said, he shall be in you. And he had further said, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I go away, I will send him unto you. Henceforth, through the Spirit, Christ who was, about, was to abide continually in the hearts of his children. Their union with him was closer than when he was personally with them. <clears throat> so Jones goes on. That is what he wants us to have now. He wants us to have now what they got at Pentecost, the personal presence of Jesus Christ. And if we have that, he will be closer to us than if he was here in the body. 
He wants to come closer to you and me than he would be if he should come to the meeting here every night and sit down with us. That is what he wants now. Now, when we think about this um, in the context of the world today, in the context of Adventism, I mean, to have the personal presence of Jesus Christ, we know that we started out this series of meetings, Jones did, um, talking about the need of the Holy Spirit. And of course, this is what's being talked about, the Holy Spirit coming to us. But the work of the Holy Spirit is a three-step testing prophetic message, is it not? When he has come, the comforter has come, he shall convict or convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more, and of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And Ellen White adds, and soon he shall be cast out. So when we look at this sin, righteousness, and judgment, is this not a three-step testing prophetic message? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it not justification, sanctification, and judgment? Yes. Okay. And, and, this, and that's where we will reflect Christ's character in the end as we go through this process. So when we talk about the personal presence of Jesus Christ, people imagine it's some kind of feeling that they might have. So we pray for the Holy Spirit. Uh, we get worked up maybe in some way. Um, something happens and we feel that we have the Holy Spirit. Do we have the Holy Spirit in that way? Because what, what are people looking for when they think about the personal presence of Jesus Christ? What do they expect? You know, when they're thinking about the personal presence of Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit, they expect something exciting to happen, right? Some kind of conversion experience or something to that. Effect. Something supernatural. Something supernatural. Now, there is something supernatural in having the person, personal presence of Jesus Christ. But they expect something supernatural that's more like um, um, like winning the lottery, so to, so to speak, spiritually. Right? Pretty much. Yeah. Isn't that what people expected when they thought November 9th was the close of probation, that they would stop sinning? They needed to stop sinning before the close of probation so that they could continue to not sin after the close of probation. That if they could just stop sinning before November 9th came, then after that, they, they would have no trouble stopping sinning. Right? So these ideas have pervaded this movement. I mean, I listened to some of these meetings and, and read some of these papers that people were writing. And I know people in our group that still are in our group had the same idea about what overcoming sin was. But when we have the personal presence of Jesus Christ, this is Christ in us. And, and if we understand who Christ is, we can't expect something that's going to be, um, Anything different than a cross? Because if you have the mind of Christ, aren't you going to have the experience of Christ? And what was Christ's experience? Was he, did he have a happy-go-lucky childhood, for instance? No. No. Satan made sure of that. Yeah, and he was constantly criticized by his brothers for how he, you know, would share things with others. This is Ellen White. Um, you know, he'd share his meal with some, some 
but he needed it more than him. And his brothers would criticize him for this. And he would feel guilt as if he had done something wrong, because obviously he's a child and his brothers are higher authority. But he did what he knew his father wanted him to do. When we follow Christ, everything's not going to be sunny and roses. There's going to be trials, fearful trials that, that parallel Christ's experience. Yeah, Christ's experience was of self-sacrifice daily. See, we want to we want to get to heaven and we want to stop sinning. At least we think we do. But we don't understand the cost because we don't have the mind of Christ. And if we had the mind of Christ, we would understand the cost. We would understand how far we are. We wouldn't feel righteous if we had the mind of Christ. So when Christ wants to come closer to you and me than he would be if he should come to the meeting here every night and sit down with us, um, we have a hard time understanding what that would mean. So um, it says here, the light and love and power of the indwelling Christ shone out through them so that men beholding marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So that was spirit of prophecy. That steps to Christ, I believe, still that he's reading. Here's a statement in testimony number 31, page 156. The message born in the love of Christ with the worth of souls constantly before us would win even from the worldlings the decision they are like Jesus. The time has come when he wants that message born that way. And he is going to have it born that way. If those who profess his name now will not let him come in in his fullness, so they can bear the message that way, he will find a people that will. That is where we are now. We cannot dally any longer. All that Christ was to the first disciples, he desires to be to his children today. For in that last prayer, with the little band of disciples gathered about him, he said, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. Jesus prayed for us, and he asked that we might be one with him, even as he is one with the Father. What a union is this? The Savior had said of himself, the Son can do nothing of himself. The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Then if Christ is dwelling in our hearts, he will work in us. Um. <clears throat> Jones goes on, the man that is so anxious and so dreadfully afraid that you will not let him have any works to do and that you are going to destroy all his works, if Christ is dwelling in his heart, he finds he will find works to do. Brethren, don't be so anxious about works. Find the Lord Jesus Christ and you will find work more than you can do. Now, again, a statement like this could be taken out of context. And, and people have taken this out of context. They'll take statements of Jones, these stray sort of statements. But, but Christ is, or, you know, Christ can do in us a work. But not if we're producing our own righteousness. So being anxious about works is focusing on the wrong thing. It doesn't mean that you, you don't recognize your sin and seek to forsake it. It's just that our works are not righteous. And of course, Jones here is trying to really focus upon the work that God wants us to do. He says, but the difficulty is when people get their minds on works and works and works instead upon Jesus Christ in order to work, they pervert the whole thing. Satan does not care how much a man professes justification by faith and righteousness by faith, so long as he keeps his mind on works. That is just the thought that is before us here in this definition of faith that we read the other night. Let me read it again, page 69, in Steps to Christ. When we speak of faith, there is a distinction that should be borne in mind. There is a kind of belief that is wholly distinct from faith. 
the existence and power of God, the truth of his word, are facts that even Satan and his hosts cannot at heart deny. They believe that, but what power does their believing it bring to them to make them righteous or to enable them to do good works? What power is there in their belief? What power does that give them? Congregation says none. No, it is always a way off there, simply as a theory. Held off to look at. Held as a theory, held as a creed. And so a spirit even can believe in the existence and power of God. He can believe the truth of the Bible. He can believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Holy One of God, and to be a devil. And in the form of a papist, he can believe all this is this way and profess justification by faith at the same time. And he can be a stickler for what they call good works at the same time. Yes, he can work the very skin off his bones in order to be good, in order to be righteous, in order to move God, as we read the other night. You know they do it. You know they make pilgrimages and do penances and fairly wear themselves out. And in addition to these things, they will shut themselves off from every earthly comfort. But who is doing the work? Who in these things does the work? Self does the work in order to be righteous, in order to have that treasure of merit that will give an increase of grace in this world and an increase of glory in heaven and what is it for is it not that is what it's it is for is it not congregation yes who is doing it then congregation self yes sir has the mind ha, as the heart has the heart been yielded to god are the affections fixed upon him is the surrender of all to him no and therefore it is still self in all. Who then is to do the work in order that it may be good works always? Let us read again. If Christ is dwelling in our hearts, he will work in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We shall work as he works. We shall manifest the same spirit. And thus, loving him and abiding in him, we shall grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now then, that is what the Lord wants. That is what the mind of Christ is. As we had the thought the other evening, I cannot have the mind of Christ separate from him. I cannot have the mind of Christ without having him personally. But the personal presence of Jesus Christ is just what he wants to give us by the Holy Spirit in the outpouring of the latter rain just now. Um, the personal presence of Christ is what he wants to give us. Then the rest of that definition of belief, a person may believe in the existence and power of God. He may believe in the truth of the Bible. He may believe and say that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Holy One of God, and yet be a devil. But that is not faith. There is no power in that kind of belief to help anybody. It is not that the secret of all these exhortations that have come to us in the testimonies all these years that... The truth must not be kept in the outer court, but must be brought into the inner sanctuary of the soul. Is not that what this means? Congregation, yes. It is not the idea, is not the idea there that men will hold the truth away off and look at it as a theory and put their own construction upon it and their own interpretation into it and then go about of themselves to do what they believe. That is not faith. Here is faith where there is not only a belief in God's word, but a submission of will to him, where the heart is yielded to him, the affections fixed upon him. Now, these are weighty expressions. They're worth considering. The submission of the will to him, is it done? Is your will submitted to him, never to be taken back or exercised in your own way or for yourself? Is your will surrendered to him? Yours, yours, I mean, has he your will, says one, I think he has, well, you want to know it, well, says another, I have been trying to submit my will to him, well, stop trying to submit your will to him and be done with it and know it, the submission of the will to him, is your will submitted to him, is it gone so that you know it is gone, and that you have no wish or impulse or any inclination ever in any situation to use it yourself is it gone you can know it 
and you can know whether it is done. The voice says, how? How? Why, by doing it, telling the Lord it is done, and it is so. Of course, a man knows it is so when it is done. A voice, if he does not know it, it is not done. Exactly. Now, again, Jones can be misunderstood in this context. Because when he's talking about knowing here, what does he mean by no? I was the experience. Okay, but is he seeing it? That is, is he knowing it by sight or is he knowing it by faith? So let's go someplace here. Um, and this is um, this is the passage Jones does some presentations on in other places. Um, and this is in First John. I think Wagner does quite a bit of this in First John. Now, if you if you go through First John, it's it's a very powerful book. Because it talks about how God is love, and that if we love God, we'll keep his commandments. Um, so it's, it's pretty much in the same spirit of what Jones is talking about here. here. So like 1 John 4, 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Here is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If any man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. So um, John goes on in this. Now he's going to talk here um, uh, about the keeping of the commandments of God. And, and <clears throat> the one that I particularly like is John 5 verse 3. But you could start at verse 2 even, or verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Right? So if we're born of God, we're going to love those that Christ loves. Right? We're going to love our brother. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, so here he's going to talk about this testimony or this witness that we have that we can know that we are in Christ, that we, that we are obeying God. Uh, so because this is one of those controversial verses, people often never spend the time to actually understand what John is saying here. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. So water baptism, we know what that is, but also blood. That's not just being water baptized, making a profession, but it's actually experiencing the cross. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his son. So when he talks about a witness here, this is the 
how we know something. We have a witness, a testimony that helps us to understand um, who Christ is, but also understand our experience. For he says, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. So if we believe on Christ, if we believe on the Son of God, we have have the witness in ourselves. Now, this witness that we know that we are the children of God, he that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. So there's those that believe in the Son of God, they have the witness in, in themselves. But the, he that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. And he that hath not the son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Right? So when we talk about this confidence, is this confidence in ourselves? It should not be. No. So in all that Jones is saying about this knowing, this isn't about knowing anything about us. It's knowing something about God. Can you see? Can you understand that? What, what I'm saying here? It's Because if we're going to know it, we're not going to know it of ourselves. We have to know it because we know God. You can't fool yourself into knowing that you know God. You can try. Right? People try it all the time. And they might be able to do it for a few moments, maybe even for a day or maybe even for a little while longer. But they can't really know it because they won't have the witness in themselves. They won't have the actions. They won't have the character of Christ. And so what, what they have to do is every once in a while they have to start over again and try to get that witness back in themselves. But that's not the witness of God because they don't know God. So if we know God, we would know that we know God. So, I mean, it's a limitation of human language here that Jones is running into. Because he's trying to make a point, but people could take what he's saying and look at this as a type of self-righteousness. Okay, so let's read. If a man does not know it, that is the strongest possible evidence that he could have, that he could have, that it is not done. So if you don't have the witness in yourself, in the way that John is saying it, that would be pretty strong evidence that it is not done. Now, when it is done, ah, he knows it. That is the very thing when it is done he becomes a spiritual man and he knows that he never knew knows what he never knew before in his life the natural man cannot receive it he cannot understand it he can he never can how in the world can i understand what there is in the doing of a thing i never did here is something that you have done you know how it goes but i never did it and yet i want you to explain it all to me so that i will understand just how it is done without the doing of it myself Brethren, that is not straight, and much less is it straight in this thing. For this to be known, 
and can be known only between God and the individual himself. They shall be all taught of God. One can tell another that it is a fact. One can tell another what he knows that it is a fact. But no one can give it to another so that my brother can get it from me. I can tell him it is a fact and that he can know it, but he must learn it from God. You do it simply by yielding to God. That is the only way any man can do it or know it. Lots of people do not understand how, but the worst difficulty is they will not do it when you tell them how. Now I ask again, is your will submitted to him? Is that thing done? Have you gone over that barrier and stand where you know that you stand there and that you know that your will is surrendered to him for him to use in his way and that there is no further question about it and no dissent from it in any way. Now is your will submitted to God for him to use as he pleases? And you have no objection to raise it all. You have not thought, not no thought or inclination to use it your way. You want him to do his way. And that is all you care for. Is that so? Is your will there? The congregation says, yes. Are, are any here in whom it is not so? You just go and tell the Lord all about it. Tell him, Lord, I submit everything to thee. Everything goes, nothing stays. I do not retain a single thing. All is gone, everything, will and all, to thee, that thou mayest use it both to will and to do. Congregation says, Amen. Brethren, we, everyone, need to do just that here each day. The Lord wants to come in here in just the way that he will let him in. But as long as I reserve some of my will, I will go my way in spite of myself. I cannot have God use me fully. He cannot come in fully. Christ cannot come in fully unless there is a full submission to him. Let there be some dying here. Let there be some actual dying to self. That is what it means. It means death. And of course, people never struggle to die. They struggle to stay alive if there are any struggles. Bear in mind, that is not enough to want to die. Go ahead and die. That is what the Lord says. Says one, how shall I do that? He tells how. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed. Dead indeed. Brother Durland read to, read to us here yesterday. He that is dead is freed from sin. It is so. Reckon ye also yourselves to be indeed um, to be dead indeed unto sin. And God will furnish the fact. The point is, brethren, we need to get acquainted with the Lord. The trouble is, people are not personally acquainted with the Lord and do not know how these things are with him. Where the heart is yielded to him, how much of it? Congregation, all of it. It is done. Congregation, yes. The whole heart is gone. Well, says one, I have yielded all I know. Well, now just take the other step and yield all you do not know. So Elder O.S. Farron says, when a person does that, is he poor and miserable? Elder Jones, yes, sir. Elder Farron, and naked and blind? Elder Jones, yes, sir. Elder Farron, and does he know it? Elder Jones says, I say, yes, of course he is. But thank the Lord he has riches that embrace the universe. Says one, I cannot understand that. I cannot either, but I know it is a fact. So when we submit to Christ, do we still acknowledge we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? Do we ever change that opinion of ourselves? I would have to say no. no. Because if we didn't, we would then trust in self. Isn't it the Holy Spirit that reveals to us our spiritual condition? Yes. The 144,000, do they see in their life all kinds of good? Do they see themselves as righteous? Absolutely not. No, they can see in their life no good things. Now, can they remember their actual sins? No. no Cuz they've been they've gone beforehand to judgment and have been blotted out. So even though they can't see their actual sins, they don't see in themselves any good thing. Because they know what they are. The Holy Spirit has revealed to them their wretchedness, their miserableness, their poverty, and their blindness. 
And so they have no trust in self. So Jones isn't talking about somebody who trusts in himself because he knows God. He's talking about somebody who trusts in God and no longer trusts in self. And some people have a hard time with this because they believe that once they know that they know God, that they should see themselves as righteous. But Christ didn't see himself as righteous. He knew he was righteous by faith alone. He heard the words of his father spoken from the excellent glory. Thou art my beloved son. Right. And you are well pleased. Right. So he knew by faith. It was spoken at his baptism. It was spoken at the Mount of Transfiguration. And Christ accepted those words by faith in spite of what he saw. Because when he looked at his human nature, did he see the glorified human nature? No. He just saw the same thing you and I see. He saw a nature that was subject to sin. It could not do righteous apart from God. And so he clung to his father. And that's what Jones is saying. But can we know it? That is a difficult question because it depends what we mean by knowing. When we know God, we can rejoice in God, but we don't rejoice in ourselves. And we can trust that God is working in us to will and to do of his good pleasure, but we do not need to see it to know it. We only need to see that who God is. And when we see who God is, we will see that apart from him, we can do nothing. <clears throat> now, I believe there's only a little bit left here, but uh, it's too much to read now. Oh, it's still four pages, five pages, six pages. Well, oh, there's way too much. Okay. So we're going to stop there for now. And let's close with a word of prayer. <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the Sabbath. And that we have come here over this past year. Um, You know the trials that we have faced and how we have put a roadblock in the way of others. We ask for forgiveness, that you can break our, our hearts, that you can help us to recognize how little there is in us and how much there is in Christ. We pray for one another. We ask, Lord, that you can work upon uh, the hearts of the people in this movement. You can work upon our own hearts. We can see our need of you. Help us not to hinder others, to judge others, to be an accuser of the brethren, but to come together in unity and love as we join with Christ. Please help us to be a blessing to others, to draw those who are seeking truth, to draw them to you. And be with us now. Give us a good rest for those who need to sleep. And um, we ask that you can be with us tomorrow morning as we worship you. Be with Brother Dwight in his presentation tomorrow and with Daniel Fontenot as well in his. And... Um, May your spirit bring our hearts into unity with you and with each other is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.